Alright, I'm the pop culture alcoholic and I'm suffering from a media hangover. <sighs> Why? Why do they have to make another origin story? It, what was wrong with the last Well, a lot of things were wrong with the last one, but... I mean... Why? <sighs> Here we are again. Let's review another crappy Hulk movie. You know when you have a big drunken night out and the next day instead of sobering up you have another drinks night and you end up with a double strength hangover afterwards? Well that's what watching both these Hulk movies feels like. Obviously I covered the first Hulk movie in my last review and that time I ended up nearly sober so this time I've come prepared. <sighs> so let's get ready to watch the shorter and somehow less salvageable the 2008 The Incredible Hulk. So, once again, we have our standard opening credits, but this time we brush right over the Hulk's origin story. I'd complain, but fuck it. It's better than doing it half an hour in. When will these Hulk movies learn the idea of splitting the difference? We see that when Banner first hulked out, he hospitalised his girlfriend Betty, and so had to go on the run, hiding from Colonel Thunderbolt. Seriously, I've never done anything nice for another human being, Ross. That's Edward Norton's Bruce Banner, by the way. Edward Norton plays a character with two personalities. Really pushing their barrier, aren't we? So we cut to Brazil where Banner is in hiding and has taken a job at a bottling factory where they seem to be making that hallucinogenic vegetable juice from the Simpsons. How the hell did he see that? The audience couldn't have seen it without slow motion and extreme close-ups. Banner has to avoid anyone getting hold of his blood because it's full of gamma particles and it could be traced back to him. Anyway, the fact is there seems to be a smoking hot worker who I goddamn wish was the love interest in this movie. But since there are more stereotypical assholes in the Hulk movies than there are in the Karate Kid films, some douchebag at the factory is coming onto this smoking Brazilian in a manner that seems just a tad... rapey. The fight is stopped before it starts and Banner heads home. Seems he is in contact with some scientist in America who is trying and failing to cure his condition. But it looks like Banner didn't get the right bottle as his blood has made it to America and drunken oddly enough by Stan Lee. I always knew someone would poison him one of these days. This has the army coming after him. But at the same time, Banner conveniently realises he needs to head back to America anyways because his American scientist contact needs more data that can only be found at Banner's old lab. When a SWAT team arrives, Banner escapes out the window, apparently running into another gorgeous woman. So Brazil is full of gorgeous women who don't care that much when you're climbing through their windows. Excuse me a minute, I gotta go book my next holiday. The army attack Banner, but Banner also runs into asshole Dell's stereotype. Bruce hulks out, but we don't get to see the Hulk. He beats the army and heads to America. Back in America, some battle crazy soldier named Emil Blonsky is chatting with Colonel Ross. Blonsky, how old are you? 45? 39. It takes a toll, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So we'll get out of the trenches. You should be a colonel by now with your record. Nah, I'm a fighter. I'll be one for as long as I can. Yeah, you know, if I could take what I know now, put it in the body I had ten years ago, that would be someone I wouldn't want to fight. I could probably arrange something like that. Because at this point, I have no reason to be wary of tampering with nature. What would the success we had with the last guy? Meanwhile, Banner is back in America, and after meeting up with his Italian restaurant-owning friend, he sneaks into the lab just as a pizza boy. Hey, pal, get a delivery on five. I don't think you have anybody up here. Ah, oh, man. I'm gonna catch hell if I don't collect. You gotta let me try. I'll tell you what, I got an extra medium. Take it on the house. By the way, check out the original TV series Hulk, Lou Ferrigno as the security guard. Nice cameo, but I'd stay away from the pizza if I were you, Lou. Those moves don't look so much like muscle in that shirt. You are the man. God bless you, brother. 
He is not man. He is. <laughs> What, what the fuck? No, of course you can't go on our government computers. We're holding secrets here the top priority. We're making leaps and bounds in technological research that others would kill to get hold of. Holy shit, is that pizza? But it seems Banner's data is gone, so he heads back to the Italian restaurant where he accidentally bumps into Betty Ross, who now has a boyfriend. And here we see Liv Tyler playing Betty Ross, sporting the biggest, most artificial-looking lips I've seen since Scarlett Johansson in the island. And on top of that, Liv whispers more in this movie than she did in The Lord of the Rings. I want you to come with me now. Is everything okay? No. I don't think so. Bruce. Bruce. Banner tries to leave again, but Betty catches up with him and takes him back to her place, where she has the data he needs stored on a memory stick. And we get one of the quietest sexual tension scenes ever shot. You might wanna. Thanks. You have everything you need? Yeah. I. I. Good night. Speak normally! I can't hear a friggin' thing! Plus, I don't know what Liv Tyler is doing with her voice, but it seems to be putting me in mind of Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors. Anyway, they head to their separate beds, blah blah, green sheet symbolism. Meanwhile, Thunderbolt Ross is getting out the Hulk serum to inject a meal. Being a general and not a scientist, he knows not only where that stuff is stored, but also how to administer it with almost no help. Actually, this doesn't really make sense, considering Banner wasn't injected with anything, just blasted with radiation. But who cares? Bruce and Betty head to the bus station so that they both can leave, stopping for some reason at the college grounds, even though they know that everyone there is on a witch hunt for him. You know, I was actually wearing the hat for a reason, it's because... Shit, well there you go. This is why you should never remove the hat. Yep, the army just turn up. No way of them knowing Bruce was there. I'm guessing they just kept hundreds of men in their large military vehicles all posted at the ready on the college grounds for the past five months. Damn it, man! He was here twice already and we weren't ready for him. Operation Taxpayers' Money Down the Toilet is a total failure! Banner runs into the building and swallows the memory stick with his data on it. Target is in the overpass. We have a visual. Do not engage! Repeat, do not engage! Get her back here! Haha! <laughs> <laughs> a military soldier just got punched out by Eowyn, a woman whose biggest physical challenge in Lord of the Rings is a twig in the face. Banner is trapped, so he hulks out, and now we get our first look at the Hulk. And I actually prefer the effects from the 2003 movie. At least I actually kind of believe that the Hulk was there at lots of points, even if he looked kind of ridiculous with his big green skin. But this Hulk looks more artificial than... than Liv Tyler's lips. So the army throw all they have at the Hulk to pretty much no effect. RUN, YOU IDIOTS! Cover me. Remember me! Oh yeah! John, right? So Blonsky pulls some impressive moves against the Hulk before leading him to some sound cannons which the Hulk quickly escapes. Is that it? Blonsky, pull back now. 
Is that all you got? Our movie, you total bastard! Probably the most brutal and hulkish moment in the entire set of movies, and you skip over half of it! So the military send in one of their helicopter gunships, again, as if they haven't seen any evidence to suggest that the Hulk is invulnerable to bullets. Yeah, just keep firing, I'm sure we'll start hurting him at some point. The chopper explodes and the Hulk shields Betty from the explosion with his giant body. I still believe in it more than in Man of Steel. So the Hulk goes off with Betty and we're getting right into King Kong territory at this point. I'm so emo! So Bruce changes back by morning and they head to a motel for cover and Betty buys Bruce some new clothes. Meta. There's a bit of a romantic atmosphere and it's not long before they start getting freaky. Wait, Betty, don't you have that boyfriend thing to be getting back to? Ah, this is a kid's movie. This sex scene will be tame. It, I, huh. be able to perform. So Bruce and Betty begin to head towards New York to find their scientist friend who with the new data should be able to cure Bruce. When it happens, what do you experience? Remember those experiments we volunteered for at Harvard? Those induced hallucinations? It's a lot like that. It's a thousand times amplified. It's like someone's poured a liter of acid into my brain. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. Maybe your mind is in there. It's just overcharged and can't process what's happening. I don't want to control it. I want to get rid of it. Well, you did it in the Avengers. And if you did do it, you know, it might be helpful. You know, some might consider it a good thing. Meanwhile, Blonsky is back on his feet after having healed from almost every bone in his body being destroyed. And he's ready for another crack at the Hulk. After a few more injections, naturally. The army have found out Bruce's anonymous scientist friend's name is Samuel Stearns. Ha ha alliteration. And the army set off for New York as well. They get to New York and decide to take a cab. And here we get to see some of the most cutting edge satire put to film in decades. Come on now! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Best character in the entire movie, everyone. I'm gonna miss him. Finally, they meet Mr. Stearns, who turns out to be a bit of a douchebag. Even if everything goes perfectly, if we induce an episode, if we get the dosage exactly right, is that gonna be a lasting cure or just some antidote to suppress that specific flare up? I don't know. But without much ado, they go through the process that's meant to cure Bruce. And it seems to work. He stops hulking out and is incapable of doing it again. But it looks like Stearns has some less than sane plans for what he's got left of the Hulk. You didn't send me much to work with, so I had to concentrate it and make more. With a little more trial and error, there's no end to what we can do. This is potentially Olympian. This gamma technology has limitless applications. We'll unlock hundreds of cures. We will make humans impervious to disease. Come on, Terminator 2 was more subtle than this. But at that moment, the army turn up, and Emil, with no Hulk to fight, knocks Banner on his ass. The army stick Banner in a chopper and head for an army base. But Emil stayed behind. Desperate for more power, he gets Stearns to give him some more Hulk juice, and Stearns helps all too willingly. 
As Emil changes, Stearns gets some Hulk juice on a cut in his head, causing him to start turning into Megamind, and God knows what happened to him after that because we never see him again. By a random character who could be sequel bait, but let's face it, just plain won't be. But Emil is now the abomination and takes to the streets. What the hell was that? It was the most reasonably priced practical effect we could find. Impressed? Well, since Abomination has decided to show up for the last 15 minutes of the movie, Banner decides he's got to go back, and rather than wait for the chop to land, he's going to have to jump. Stop! Stop! What are you doing? Think about this. You don't even know if you'll change. Exactly! Stop, you moron! It's a chopper. It'll take, like, a second to land. No, of course he survives, and the Hulk and Abomination do some pretty standard fighting until Abomination brings down the chopper with Betty and Colonel Ross in it, and a gas leakage is about to ignite. Bullshit! The Hulk clapped out of fire? That's just... Ridiculous! Even if it weren't for the fact that the chopper would explode instantly, and even if it weren't for the fact that you can't be covered in fire and then come out without a scratch on you, and even if it weren't for the fact that the idea of clapping out a fire is ridiculous given the size of the Hulk's hands and the size of the fire, even putting all that aside, aircraft fuel does not ignite when exposed to flames. It's like diesel. It's not that combustible. None of this makes any sense! Anyway, after that, the Hulk and Abomination fight some more, and the Hulk says his catchphrase, even though it really builds up to almost nothing. The Hulk gets Abomination in a headlock, and Abomination just gives up. Even though he could easily just get up and keep on fighting, he just admits defeat. Then the Hulk leaps off into the distance, apparently somehow escaping, when we've already seen the choppers are clearly able to keep up with him. We then cut to some time later, where we see Banner in a new house in the woods, and we see him suffer another Hulk attack. The end. God, this movie was not worth the time spent on it. I know that when setting up loads of characters for the Avengers as this movie was a part of, the plots for the movies could get a little samey, but this film definitely brings nothing new to the table. The acting is standard, the plot is standard, Liv Tyler's kind of sexy, but her character is still really flat. Edward Norton was good, but I'm still really glad that they cast Mark Ruffalo in the end for the Avengers. I never really felt Norton capture the powerlessness of Banner or his fear of the Hulk as well as Ruffalo did, though improved writing also helped. I got low. I didn't see an end, so I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. This film also had some major holes and is really just an establisher for the Hulk before the Avengers and doesn't work at all as a standalone film. At least I can say I enjoyed some parts of the 2003 Hulk movie. <laughs> This one was just dull, left a stale taste in my mouth, and does not use Norton to his full potential. However, there is one major flaw that runs throughout both of these Hulk movies, but I, I can't quite lay my finger on it. But I feel like... I feel like it's close. Oh god, what's happening to me? <laughs> god, I can feel him. I can feel he's close. Ah! Hello, pop culture alcoholic. What the fuck are you doing here? I was always going to come back. You knew that deep down. No, it's not possible. Oh, but it is. How? You haven't had a single drink in the last 20 hours. No, I've, I've been drinking gin all the way through the review. Look again. Yes, and now it's time for me to come back. The other you. The sober you. The you who actually gets dressed in the morning. No, I won't let you.
I'll drink you away, you bastard. You don't want to be doing that, alcoholic. Why the hell wouldn't I? Because you can't sum up the problems with these movies on your own. You need a relatively coherent argument, and that's beyond you. Isn't it? You bastard. I knew you'd see it my way. Okay then. Do it. So let's begin. The aim of these movies almost throughout is to make out the Hulk as this uncontrollable creature of destruction. The Hulk is meant to be without thought or logic, destroying all in his path. No concept of mercy or morals, just an awesome ball of rage. But we never really see that in these films. The Hulk is only ever seen to attack bad guys or people who provoke him. Even the most brutal scene in this film, when the Hulk nearly kills Emil Blonsky, Emil was provoking him and was a bad guy. You can tell that they tried to show the Hulk was capable of killing people Banner was close to by saying the Hulk hurt Betty at the beginning of the film, but we didn't actually see that and we never see any other instance when he even comes close to that. The filmmakers want us to root for the Hulk to some extent, but when Banner talks about him we're supposed to actually fear him. It's very difficult to show the Hulk as both a terrifying force of destruction and someone the audience can support, especially when bound by a very black and white sense of right and wrong that's frequently misconstrued as necessary in a kids movie. This was achieved better in the Avengers, but only by flat out making up some random excuse that Banner could suddenly control his powers. Fortunately, that movie was so well done that everyone let it slide. The Hulk only actually makes two appearances in the Avengers. In the first appearance, he is clearly merciless and unthinking, but then in his second appearance, we get to see him doing good in the end. I mean, it didn't actually make any sense, but it achieved both of the necessary angles. One show that I think actually effectively achieved the aim of the Jekyll Hyde fear of one's own self was the TV series Jekyll. They really built up the Hyde character well in that series and although we never actually saw Hyde hurt anybody who we would consider a good guy or close to the Jekyll character, we did always feel that he could and was on the verge of doing so at any moment. And yet we do still later come to root for Hyde. With these Hulk movies we never even get a sense that the Hulk is dangerous because as soon as he's confronted with anyone who's a good guy he goes all soft and spongy. The Hulk could make a great anti-hero, but instead is always the hero. On top of that, it's very hard to get the right amount of focus on how hard it is for Banner to be the Hulk without it becoming just dull moaning, especially when you don't back it up with evidence that the Hulk is a burden when he's actually seeming like quite a handy superpower to have. If I were to recommend one way that you could go about achieving the angle correctly is by actually building up the fact that the Hulk is indeed dangerous, but then breaking the ice with some humour and some light-hearted attitude towards the split personality, as was done in both the Avengers and in the TV series Jekyll. It's much harder to hate a character when we're able to see the funny side of their existence. And it's also very much possible for a character to be three-dimensional enough to actually do bad things but then be forgiven for it later on. All in all, the Hulk's a very difficult character to portray correctly in film, but the Avengers managed to do it in a way that people actually liked, and that at least fills me with hope that one of my favourite superheroes may one day make a great film. I'm Lego Cheetah, and... Don't worry. He'll be back. I need some spot cream. What the fuck did he do to my chin?